today on Family Talk. The Apostle Paul endured many hardships during his missionary journeys, but there was one problem, however, that became so disruptive in his life that he prayed for relief. God did not grant that request, but instead responded with, my grace is sufficient for you. This is Family Talk, the broadcasting division of the James Dobson Family Institute. I'm Roger Marsh with your host, best-selling author and popular psychologist, Dr. James Dobson. Today, we're turning back the clock on a classic broadcast featuring Dr. Dobson alongside Roger and Darlene Anderson. Now, the Andersons are an incredible couple who have withstood tremendous difficulties in their family. I don't want to give away anything about their story, so let's get started. Here now is Dr. Dobson to introduce the Andersons and their story on this classic broadcast of Family Talk. Roger, you're a businessman? Or right. You own a business, is that right? Yeah, small business. And Darlene, you're a full-time mom, a former school teacher, I yes. understand. How many years did you teach school? Um, I taught seven years and then retired to... Uh, to raise children. To raise my family, yes. My wife Shirley did exactly the same thing, seven years of teaching and then a full-time mom. Do you think you'll ever go back? Uh, because I homeschool my oldest two, I really am still actively teaching, so uh, uh -huh. I enjoy that much more. Uh, how did you get into homeschooling? I think that... Um, we didn't like the alternative. <laughs> <laughs> but I think just from the beginning when my son was just a toddler, just thinking of what we could do with him at home and having been a teacher, I guess I, I just felt like I would like to share that experience with him. Has it been what you expected it to be? It's a lot of work, isn't it? It's, yes, it is. I was just talking to someone about this earlier today. There's never enough time. I'll she, bet she's a fantastic teacher is what I've been. When she, in between other kids and problems and things like that, yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> and the last thing or the next thing that our listeners need to know about you, Darlene, is that uh, you're going to have baby number seven. Well, we want to walk uh, through your personal story uh, in this program and let people know where you've been. And the portion of it that we're particularly interested in here uh, started with the birth of your third child, yes. Darren. Okay, pick it up there and tell us what you learned. Well, Darren um, came along seemingly fine, like our other two, normal delivery and everything. Um, but just probably a few months after he was born, we noticed that there was something just slightly different with him. I guess an, an easy way to say it is he was like a rag doll, just very mm. floppy and didn't develop quite like the other two had developed. And he was progressing, but very slowly. And we talked about it back and forth and, and didn't want to mm. take him in right away, you know, thinking maybe we're being a little paranoid. And yeah. uh, I'm the type of person that if it isn't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> so I don't go running to the doctor yeah. for everything. And uh, so I just thought, well, he was just like a little loose goose, you know. We other kids, I could sit him on my hand and carry him around just straight in front of my chest, and it wouldn't be a problem at all. But him, he'd just go, whoop, fall right <laughs> over. Uh, we just, like I said, I just thought it was just a difference in a child, but it turned out to be something more yes, than that. And we know now that is a warning sign. Uh, we were starting to say things, I think, not even consciously realizing, making observations that we, you know, just kind of storing them away, like Roger would say, he doesn't know my voice. He doesn't turn to me when I call him. And he doesn't listen to me. Yeah, or I, I remember telling someone, this is not an auditory learner. I think he's visual or something, yeah. you know. And uh, finally, um, it bothered me so much that he consented and we took mm -hmm. him in. And they did a, an evaluation of him, but basically um, came back with, well, he's a little on the slow side developmentally, but he's still within range. So, what age was he then? Um, he was uh, probably just about eight months by mm -hmm. then. But one little test they had done there uh, bothered me, and when I went home, I decided I was going to try the same test and see if I could get any different results. And that was they had taken a little bell and tried to ring it next to his ear, and he turned. But I think the, he saw the mm -hmm. bell. And so I sat him in his high chair and gave him something to occupy himself with and stood behind and rang a little bell. And when I noticed he didn't respond, I called Roger and showed him. And he said, well, you have to have something to really get his attention. So he got out a couple big pan lids. Husbands mm -hmm. do things in a big way. <laughs> <laughs> and crashed them together right behind him. And when we saw that he was still 
playing with what mm. we gave him. It was like we knew right then. This yeah. answered all the questions. Everything that we had thought and said came together right then. We didn't even have to really discuss it. In fact, right away, I got out the phone book. I looked up an audiologist and called mm. and made an appointment to have him seen. Well, of course, this was near the end of the week, and I couldn't take him in yeah. until the first of the next week. And so that was probably one of those long weekends yeah. of my life. We've all been there yes. over one thing or another. And I, I think, you know, I questioned and answered all my Your own fears questions, and right? everything yeah. that weekend. And I don't think we ever said, God, why? We always felt like this is the way God has made him. But at the same time, I still grieved because I started thinking, he'll never hear music or the birds you know, or, your voice. or my voice say, I love you. And I went to church that Sunday and took him, and I didn't want to tell anyone because I wanted to make sure mm -hmm. that it wasn't just some silly idea we had. And so I went through the motions, and everyone you know, put him in the nursery with all the other children who were playing, and, and uh, it was a very difficult time for me then to realize I know there's something wrong and yeah. I can't really share with anyone. And the next week you had it confirmed medically. Yes. The audiologist put him in a booth and did all kinds of sounds, of course, and we have no family history of deafness, so this was something totally new to us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we really knew nothing about it. And the audiologist was... Now we, we believe a poor choice, but we had no knowledge of audiologist either. He was scribbling on paper, and basically when he got finished, he said, I've confirmed, this is right, your son is deaf. You'll probably want to do some more tests later on. That was basically all he told me. Mm. And I noticed he had been writing on a paper, and I said, well, can I at least have a copy of what you're working on? And what it was was an audiogram, which mm. is a paper, it's like a graph. You have decibels, which are loudness on yes. going vertically, and frequencies going across. And I took that home and tried to figure out what this paper said. And at the bottom, he wrote, no response at 90 decibels, which mm -hmm. is fairly loud. And um, Did he write the word profoundly? No, yeah. there was a key on it. Well, what I did was I went home and called the library, and I said, can you give me some, ex um, look up decibels and Tell me what different sounds make, you know, how many decibels. Yeah. And, and of course, we learn. We've learned a lot since then, but maybe 10 decibels, it's like leaves rustling. And then you get down to 120 decibels, which is a jet airplane taking off. Mm. So you have everything in between. And so 90 is pretty bad, you know, when there's no yeah, response at all. If he didn't hear that, he, then right. he's not hearing. <laughs> so we contacted him again. He said, your son is so deaf, he'll never learn to talk. Um hearing aids will never help him so i suggest you decide to start communicating with him through sign language and we were fortunate god worked in that he brought other people in and then she's going to get to that but uh whenever something like this happens just don't take the first opinion that you get you have to be an advocate for your kid you have to go out there and do the research yourself because on this we thought our only recourse was to go with doing sign language and I thought man I'm never going to learn sign language <laughs> when mm. it comes to that sort of thing I'm pretty slow first Roger uh, tell me how this diagnosis hit you I've been a Christian ever since I was uh, four years old and in the back of my mind I've always tried to reference things in a Christian perspective you know mm. at the time it all comes down to your frame of reference. You know, what are the principles? What are the, mm -hmm. what are the things that determine how you handle things? And it really came down to the fact that God is sovereign. Mm -hmm. And whatever is his plan, I have to go with that. And I, that's a theological position and an understanding. But pain was still there, and it's in your eyes, in well, your voice right now. Yes, it is. It's not nearly so much with me as it is my wife. Yeah. She responds to that so much more than I do. I guess it's because of the way I'm sewn together inside. But I I remember when we first realized that it happened, and we were at church on a Sunday morning, and we sort of waited around for the pastor to uh, kind of get done with the bulk of the people and everything so we could kind of let them know what had happened. And 
Darlene was there, and of course, you know, she wasn't doing well emotionally. But uh, I just felt a lump in my throat about the thing, and we told him that he was deaf. And in some ways, there's so little deafness out there, a lot of people don't even comprehend. No understanding. That. They have zero understanding about it. And, and they know it's a serious thing, but they don't really understand the, all the ramifications of it. Um, it's like right now, it's very difficult to tell our son about how to be saved. Because there's so many concepts of, um, you know, heaven, of uh, eternal life, of sin. You're talking to a seven-year-old, but you got almost like you're communicating to a baby. In order to explain sin, we have to call it bad things. Where with my other son that was four years old, or almost five when he was, was saved, it was very understandable. But we have to twist everything and frame sure. it so that— you, you really had to learn to be the parents of a deaf child, didn't you? Yeah, well, you don't automatically know how to do that. You have to learn to think for them sometimes. Yeah. You that's... have to think in a way that they can understand yeah. that you don't communicate with other people that way because their frame of language is so limited. It's, it's just very narrow. So you have to focus everything down into a real tight channel. You obviously then began exploring this problem medically, and you found that the cause of the deafness was... What? Well, he, it was determined that he has a form of what's called Mondini dysplasia. And just to simplify it, it's where the cochlea, the little snail-shaped part of the ear um, that has all the little hair um, fibers in it, stops growing at a certain point. And the normal cochlea has two and a half turns, and his only had one and a half turn. And this is a genetic? It's a genetic. Right. And at the time, in fact, we, we were told it was viral. Hmm. that I probably had contracted something during my pregnancy and caused it. So um, even that, we had so much misinformation and things at first, but I had started very aggressively learning sign language. In fact, I had it arranged that we would have a private tutor come to our home even and teach us. And I was getting this all set up, and Roger said, I know this may be the way we have to go, but I just don't feel this is right. He has to grow up in a speaking world, a hearing world, and we want him to be able to be independent. Our philosophy... So he can go to McDonald's and order a hamburger, right. yeah. you know, and not, and not try and make gestures that somebody can't communicate. that's a controversial yes, it point is. of view, isn't v- it? Very, that people well, have very is. strong yes. feelings about whether you teach sign language or English right. or uh, some it's other language. audio, auditory well, verbal. program we yeah. call. So anyway, I decided maybe I needed to do some more research. So I started writing and contacting people. And, well, actually, someone suggested I get a second opinion. We had him taken in, and this audiologist did work more with an oral program And when she got done and showed me the audiogram, which by then I had learned a lot more about audiograms, it was totally different from the first one. She had him charted that he had some low-frequency hearing. Um, And I said, now, how do I know yours is right and this other one was wrong? (laughs) And she said, I believe this is accurate. I I really have faith that he um, tested well today and that this is where he is. And she suggested we get him into hearing aids right away, which we did. And um, by 15 months old, he was able to say moo and bow wow. (sighs) And we became very aggressive. And I educated myself as much as I can. I read and um, worked extensively with him. And he made very rapid progress then. Hmm. Well, what's really tough is how do you test an eight-month-old? I mean, they can't respond. Oh, I heard that. They can't do that. And so all the audiologists can do is look for eye movements when they hear a sound on their right or their left. And so it's extremely difficult because they can really give you nothing other than a response and maybe a facial gesture, a turn of the head, or a, a, a glint in the eye. And that's all they can really use to, to you know, test where they're at. So you can't do it with precision, but you do get a, it, yes, it takes a, 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 very a trained diagnosis. Person. You do yes. know there's a hearing problem uh, in most cases, don't you? Yeah. Now, you all then were faced with a very important question about additional children. Well, not at that point, because we still had gone on the premise that... It was viral. And plus, you know, this had just happened. No family history. No family Mm -hmm. history. And um, in fact, when I was expecting my fourth child, late in the pregnancy, Roger was outside and he wanted to scare me. He lit off a firecracker. (laughs) And he didn't realize that at that very moment, the baby had been um, stirring. And so I was kind of patting my tummy and talking to the baby. 
And then when he made this loud noise, I realized the baby didn't startle, which I had remembered my older two startling late in the womb, later in the pregnancy. Yeah. And I became concerned about that. So when I went to see my doctor a couple of days later, I told him about that. And he said, what a silly thing for you to think about. He said, yeah. don't you realize that was some crazy fluke with that pregnancy? And he said, I want you to get that out of your mind and don't even think about that again. He was but, trying to be kind to you. <laughs> I think so. But Well, there's an attitude out there. I don't want to say necessarily an attitude, but deafness is so rare. Pediatricians almost, they don't test for it. There's nothing that they do that way. And, and it's just so uncommon that they mm. write it off. Mm. Anyway, that's when I began to do more research on genetics. And I began learning some of the things that we know now, that everyone carries six to ten bad genes. And if you happen to mate with someone who is also carrying one of those bad genes, that the chances of the right combination is one in four. Yeah. So basically we would have a 25%, every child we'd have would have a 25% chance of having that happen. It's Mendelian recessive, which means that you both carry the gene right. for this deafness. Right. And so when our little girl was born um, and we were at the hospital, I begged and pleaded for the doctors to test her. I just had that, still had the uneasiness. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't do it. They said, well, you have to be scheduled ahead of time, and it's too loud in the nursery, and this and that. And um, I was quite frustrated, but um, maybe I wasn't as much of an advocate and as bold as I am now. Mm -hmm. And so I let it go. And when we got home, I told them to get out the pots and pans again. And as she was going to sleep just that first night, she was only two days old, he banged the pots and pans, and she didn't, didn't respond. respond. Hmm. And this is your daughter named? Brittany. 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 Once you leave the hospital, then you have to go through all kinds of things to get a, have tests done yes. and things like that. So she was actually six weeks old before we were able to get an auditory brainstem response test done, which is pretty objective to let them know if there's mm -hmm. hearing or not. Bear test, they call it. And then when we went to the audiologist, she had tested Brittany at three weeks because I asked her and she wasn't really sure, but then she realized that Brittany was far worse than Darren. And also at the same time, Darren had stopped doing well. He had like plateaued and he wouldn't learn anymore and we couldn't understand. Brittany got her hearing aids at nine weeks. My audiologist tested Darren again then and found he had lost all of that low frequency mm -hmm. hearing he had. So now we had two children in a very profound state of hearing. Mm -hmm. And um, so then, it, you know, progress went much slower then. Yeah. Now we come to that question of additional children. We knew at that point that, um, you know, if we had any more children, that this mm -hmm. definitely could happen again. We only had, we had two yeah. and two. Yeah. And I think we were really very optimistic during our fifth pregnancy because we felt... Chances were 75%. Yeah, we, yeah. that's what I said. I, we have 75% chance of you know, this child hearing. Roger, did your friends support the idea of additional children? We've had very few friends support the idea of additional children. God has for you, I think, a core of people, not the bulk of Christians in your church, but there's a, a few core people that God brings you to help you through these things. I wish it was better. I wish that, you know, the whole church rallied around you. But there are a few people that God brings in to help you through this. And there things. were a few that got you through it. There was a few. And they would come at Darlene with, uh, you know, why doesn't Roger have an operation? Or, you know, how come you're having more kids when they could be handicapped? Mm -hmm. You know, things like this that really, you know, you're struggling enough as it is. Mm -hmm. You don't really, you don't need that. You need encouragement. You need to be exhorted. Well, what is particularly painful about that is that there's an implication behind a statement like that, that a child with a disability should not be born. Right. That uh, he or she is less of a human being, and and that comes through in a moment well, like there's that. There's something bigger out there, and this is one of the things that uh, I have a problem with about the attitude of the people in our country, is that they've lost the idea that there is something bigger than ourselves out there, mm -hmm. that God has things in mind that that He really would like us to keep our hands off of, mm -hmm. and it's a terrible thing to hear about, you know. Babies being aborted when they're most of the way out of the womb and everything like this—it's just 
-hmm. it, it stabs in your heart when you know that Darren with his mm -hmm. defect and Brittany with hers, they're just as valuable as any normal kid out there. You know, God says in, in Genesis, I forget he was talking, he says, who has made man's ear? God takes full credit for mm -hmm. my child's defect. Mm -hmm. He doesn't apologize for it one bit. And he can use it for good. He, he certainly has. Yes. So you decided to go ahead and have another child. Yes. It was, I think, a little more difficult for me because mm -hmm. I knew that if it happened again, um, how much work it is. It is mm -hmm. a lot of work raising them and working with them. And so I probably struggled with that, you know, just making the decision to yeah. go ahead. But as when I, I look back now and... and I guess I would say that had we made this decision to stop because of what might happen, we would have robbed ourselves of yeah. so many joys. You wouldn't know those other kids. And they're a lot of work, but they're, they're precious yeah. children. The third child was also born yes. deaf. Well, actually, the fifth the child. The third deaf child. Yes. Our fifth child. Yeah. And a fourth one. Yes. And a sixth, yes. Our sixth child. Yes. Was so born you deaf. have four Hard of hearing children are all of them profoundly deaf. Yes, they are. Because of this defect, two of our other children, Darren and, and Brittany, both lost hearing. They can lose hearing at any time. Yes. And so she is starting out where Darren started out, but because we fitted her for molds at two days old and she began wearing hearing aids at eight days old, she is doing really quite well. How are the children doing now? And first of all, what are their ages now? Darren is seven, Brittany four, um, Bethany is two, and Allison is one. And one on the way. Yes. Uh, before we go any further, talk about where God is in this for you. Obviously, you prayed about those other three children after the first child was born deaf. Uh, what did he say to you? And what are your conclusions about where he is? I don't think God doesn't make sense. I think God makes perfect sense. But this world is so distorted by sin, and it's under a curse. The ground is cursed that we get our food from. And it really appears that God doesn't because we look at it and I think we want to say, what did I do to deserve this? Or, you know, I think we look at it from that perspective. But I you understand that is the implication of the title, when God doesn't make sense to us. Sure. And he I makes understand perfect that. sense. Absolutely. He and always makes perfect sense. But it I, just doesn't make sense to us. This world is not what it's supposed to be. This world was created to be something far different than what it is today. And we suffer in the light of that. We have defects. We have imperfections. We die. It's something that uh, uh, isn't supposed to be this way. But because we're in this world, we have to deal with it. And I think emotionally, we come up with those uh, feelings about why, why doesn't God make sense. Well, we hate to interrupt this incredible story, but uh, we are out of time for today's broadcast. So be sure to come back again tomorrow to hear the conclusion of Roger and Darlene Anderson's riveting conversation with Dr. James Dobson here on Family Talk. Did you know that you can listen to Dr. Dobson every day on your Amazon Alexa? This device allows you to stay up to date on our latest broadcasts to receive encouragement for your family. After you enable the Family Talk skill on your account, simply say, Alexa, play today's broadcast of Family Talk. It's that easy. Visit drjamesdobson.org forward slash Alexa for step-by-step -step instructions to play Family Talk on your Amazon Alexa. As we conclude today's broadcast, I want to remind you that the Dobson Family Institute is completely listener-supported. Generous listeners just like you allow us to continue fighting for the family each and every day. Learn how you can stand with us by visiting drjamesdobson.org or by calling 877-732-6825. I'm Roger Marsh. Thanks so much for listening today, and be sure to listen in again tomorrow for another edition of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute.
This is James Dobson again. Before we go, I'd like to remind you that Family Talk is a listener-supported program. If you've enjoyed this broadcast, we'd appreciate your helping to keep us on the air. As you know, we talk about everything from religious liberty to the sanctity of human life and raising boys and girls, among others. Uh, These are the passions of our hearts, and I hope they are for you, too. Thank you so much for listening and for being part of this ministry. For more information, go to drjamesdobson.org. Hey, everyone. Roger Marsh here. When you think about your family and where they will be when you're no longer living, are you worried? Are you confident? Are you hopeful? What kind of legacy are you leaving for your children and their children? Here at Family Talk, we're committed to helping you understand the legacy that you're leaving for your family. Join us today at drjamesdobson.org for helpful insights, tips, and advice from Dr. James Dobson himself. And remember, your legacy matters.